Art with M.E. and I am M.E. On this podcast, I do my two favorite things. Tell true and crazy stories about me and my life in Nacogdoches, Texas. And drink beer. Delicious, tasty, juicy beer. Today, I am drinking Voodoo Ranger Juice Force. By the way, I know that the words on the can are backwards <laughs> for the viewer. I'm so sorry. I have my camera set a certain way for a certain reason. We will fix that so that you do indeed know exactly what I am drinking so that you can get some too. Juice Force is brewed by New Belgium out of Colorado. It is a 9.5, but folks, this is Fruit Ford. And as we say in the beer world, that makes it very drinkable. Let's try it out. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, maybe a little too drinkable. This beer is hazy. What does that mean? Well, see that haze? It's not very clear because there are a lot of things like wheat and oats in here, right? Wheat and oats. That's protein, y'all. This is practically a protein shake. Yep. And that makes it hazy. So, mm -mm -mm. get you some. Shazam. Woohoo. Let's get started with episode three of The Cat Ate Her Face. <coughs> Part of a series called Murder and Crime in Nacogdoches, Texas. This is the story of Edward Otho Hagens and Elsie Marie Milner. The day everyone in Nacogdoches has waited for in that summer of 1961 has arrived. It is June 1st and this is the trial of Eddie Otho Hagens and Elsie Marie Milner. First for the murder of Beulah Gibson and then later they will be tried for the murder of her sister Zora Hagens. Today, Chief M.C. Roebuck, local legend, is going to take the stand and tell us what was in those confessions to the double homicide of those two sweet sisters who were left for the cat to eat. Roebuck is ruggedly handsome, y'all. A lot of people don't like Roebuck but the ladies do not mind looking at him. No, they do not. One lady is out in the courtroom when he takes the stand who knows him pretty, pretty well. She is Lucille Fang, a reporter for the Daily Sentinel of Nacogdoches. Her husband, Victor, is the editor-in-chief of that paper. She has a secret about Roebuck, a very personal secret, y'all. Mm-hmm. But today is about other secrets, right? Like what really happened in that house on that rainy dark night on Mound Street. Roebuck tells us that Eddie says that he and Elsie Marie paid a friendly call on his and Sora earlier on that day. He wanted to introduce his new bride to his and Sora, he says. Well, Zora would not let them in. So he went to the back door and banged until she opened the door. He says Aunt Zora and Beulah acted pretty unfriendly and didn't seem to care if they were there or not. But, he said, she acted that way always. So they left and got back in their car, he says. But Elsie Marie was not happy. Mm -mm, not at all. He did not do what he said he would do. Get the money for the wine. Remember, she needs to be well for the baby. So they drive around and they argue. Enough with the sugar I'm asking and the honey please. Eddie says Elsie Marie is very direct. He says... She says, go back and get the money. 
Eddie goes back to Aunt Zora's house. He goes into the house alone, he says. Elsie Marie waits in the car, he says. He asks Aunt Zora for the money. Aunt Zora is not giving it, y'all. Maybe Eddie sees that fat purse with the cash from the rent she collected that day. Eddie says, Aunt Zora was funny, like lots of rich folks, and had been tight with money before. I knew she had lots of property. Beulah has never met Eddie Higgins. Remember that he is not her nephew. So she tells this crazy man to go away. And that is the first hit, y'all. Mm -hmm. A strike to Beulah with the butt of a gun. But Eddie had underestimated the strength of two old ornery sisters. Beulah fought back, scratching and tearing at his clothes. Eddie says, she was a big woman. I hit her again and again, and it didn't even affect her. Beulah just kept fighting. Then the gun goes off. Accidentally, he says. Beulah falls hard. Zora screams hysterical beyond belief, out of her mind with grief. She falls to her knees beside a lifeless Beulah. Dear, dear sister, the dearest person in the world for that woman. Eddie says she screams with all she has, Eddie, what have you done? Zora is loud. She won't shut up screaming and sobbing, says Eddie. Well, he can't risk shooting her and making more noise. So he determines he will beat her to death. One minute, one minute. Let's, let's replenish a little here. Yeah. She's force. Hmm. I beat on her and I beat on her and I beat on her all over, but she kept fighting. She was old, but she was tougher than I was and kept fighting. All the while she was screaming, Eddie, Eddie, what do you want? I'll give you anything. He beat her, but she would not die, y'all. So he shot her in the mouth. He says, Elsie Marie came into the house because of the noise and stood in the doorway. He says she cleaned up. She wiped every single little part of that house for fingerprints. He grabbed the cash from Zora's purse. Elsie Marie grabbed Zora's coat and purple knit sweater. They grabbed the television too. The Beulah had just been watching, I mean, why not? And they throw it all into Zora's Studebaker Lark. Eddie's mama does not think that it happened that way at all. Sadie Mae Hagen's writes to a friend. That woman got him into this trouble. But if Elsie Marie nagged him to do it or came into the house and found the candy dish and used it herself, he isn't going to say. For one, a husband cannot testify against a wife when they are tried together. And two, he loves her, y'all. June 2nd, 1961, the last day of testimony. Pearson Holt, the defense counsel, have pretty much got nothing. Well, they have one witness to call, but they do not have a surprise in their pocket. This thing is going down and they are going down with it. And then suddenly, as the session begins, Holt excitedly jumps up. He tells Judge Summers that they have four witnesses and they are all doctors. 
doctors and they are all in the courtroom. They all know Eddie Hagen's very well and they are ready to testify for the defense. Four doctors have driven from all parts of Texas to Nacogdoches to testify on that day for the defense. That is a remarkable feat for Pierce and Holt. It's a home run, y'all, if you are rooting for the defense, which would be practically no one. <laughs> Understand that the defense counsel recognizes the abhorrent savagery of this crime. But what Pierce and Holt have learned about Eddie Hagen's from these doctors is what has made them fight for his life. Holt draws to the court. We will shout loud and strong that this man was and now is insane. All the doctors testify that Eddie Hagen's has a rare psychomotor epileptic condition. It could make him hate. It could make him violent. It could make him lose control. A doctor in Houston testifies that Eddie's first wife, Hazel, there was a first wife, brought Eddie to him because he wasn't acting right. He was disoriented. He was blacking out. He was having convulsions. That doctor told hospital personnel that the patient was dangerous. That doctor also noticed something disturbing about Hazel. Her arms, y'all, were covered up with bruises. One doctor is also Eddie's cousin. He says Eddie had never been normal. One doctor says that Eddie had the mind of a 12 year old. Holt implores the jury to think about that. 12 years old. Prosecuting attorneys are asking you to send to death this man with the brain of a seventh grader. If you give death to a man with a 12 year old's brain, you will have committed a much more terrible crime than Eddie Hagen's did up there on February 20th. Why, Eddie was just a child, y'all. A child having sex with a 37 year old woman but a child nonetheless. Hmm. This trial began on a Saturday and it ends on a Saturday. On June 3rd, 1961, 500 people start securing a courtroom seat around 6 a.m. Court TV would have been there, y'all, if they had existed. <laughs> Prosecution is District Attorney Hewlin Brown, appointed as a special prosecutor to this case, and Edmund F. Benchoff, Nacogdoches County Attorney. The Houston Press makes a point of noting the neatly combed, wavy hair of Brown and the pink cheeks of Benchoff. Their words are clipped, their stride brisk, they are so ready for the stage, y'all. In fact, in 1939, at Lawn Morris College, Hewlin Brown won Texas Best Male Actor. Prosecutor Brown begins. There was no insanity, but there was much malice. Here was a heart totally bent on mischief. It was meanness and cruelty. The defendant knew right from wrong as well as anyone. There were never two people in the state of Texas who deserved the maximum penalty more than those two. There surely were some amens from the crowd on that. Benchoff points at Elsie Marie. If either of the two deserves death more than the other, it is Elsie Marie Milner. Mildred Manson, Mrs. Eddie Logan, Elsie Marie Hagens, or any number of the other names she has used to deceive the people. 
And then Brown is going to close like the great Shakespearean actor that he is. I believe that if any penalty other than the death penalty is brought back in this case, it will cause the dark clouds of fear to hover over this courthouse. Fear and uneasiness on the part of the citizens of this community and of this county. It is here now. And I think it will increase because in these clouds, in these clouds, fear will be written in the blood of Zora Hagen's and Beulah Gibson. And just to be sure the jury understands the consequences of not sending these two to their deaths, Prosecutor Brown says, if two people ever deserve the same punishment they gave those two old ladies, they are the two sitting over there. You can give them any sentence you want to give them other than the death penalty, and you can watch them walk the streets. And then he charges the duty to do, he charges the jury to do their duty like a soldier on the battlefield. A magnificent close. I would imagine that some people stood up and cheered. The defense is not as polished. Marion Holt is wearing his usual white suspenders holding up a pair of baggy pants. His snazzy checkered purple coat is dusted with dandruff. <laughs> Pierce, his much younger partner, wears the same uniform he has worn every day of the trial. A black suit with a polka dot tie. That is because it is his only suit. One moment, please. Yes. A little more juice for us. Thank you. Everyone must have been very tired. Jeb Summers has been commuting 40 miles back and forth every day of the trial. Prosecutor Brown has been driving one hour back and forth every day. You see, back then, the district judge and district attorney covered three counties. Pierce only need walk four blocks to his home. It sits on his grandma's side yard on South Church Street. It's two rooms, y'all. His wife, Willene, is waiting for him there. She is also his legal secretary and, of course, my mama. <laughs> Together, they have filed petitions, written briefs, pled with witnesses, constructed strategy, called doctors, dropped off fruit juices for Eddie. You can read all about it in Pierce's notes in his ledger book, charging the state the little fees he could as a court-appointed attorney. And it all comes down to this moment in court. Whatever he says that day is likely to be on the front page of the Houston Post. Whatever he says that day will contribute to sparing a man's life from the electric chair or to putting him in that chair. Pierce, his red wisp of hair falling into his face, reprimands Prosecutor Brown for a lack of sympathy for his clients. He has not prosecuted this case. He has persecuted these defendants. How so? Well, Eddie was born with a deficiency for which he cannot help. And Elsie, Mag Elsie Marie is guilty of doing nothing worse than her duty as a wife. <laughs> Say what? Yes, sir, Pierce says. What could she do? She acted under coercion, duress, and fear for the husband she was to obey. It was 1961, y'all. A lot of people then would say it was a wife's biblical duty to be obedient to her husband. It is still part of many wedding ceremonies today. 
the woman will say that she is to love, honor, and obey. Wow, that defense is Pierce's best shot. In all, the trial takes 12 days. Half of that was spent just selecting a jury. But now it is over. 2.10 p.m. The charge goes to the 12 men of the jury. 2.40 p.m. The jury asks to see two items from an exhibit list of 40. They want to see the confessions. 3.30 p.m. The jury asks for 10 Cokes and two Dr. Peppers. 5 p.m. Eddie tells Sheriff Lightfoot, you know, they buried Daddy today at four. Law enforcement has become rather fond of odd but gentle Eddie Hagens. Even though he is drinking water from the jailhouse toilet. Mm -hmm. 5.30 p.m. The jury renders a verdict. The courtroom is still and hot and crowded. Senator Lane awaits vengeance for his aunts. Shirley and Sandy, again, not necessarily their real names, await sympathy for their mama. And the verdict is, Edward Otho Hagens, guilty of murder with malice. Sane at the time of the crime, sane during this trial, death in the electric chair. And he shakes, he removes his glasses, he wipes his eyes, he slumps and leans into the shoulder of Elsie Marie, the woman he has loved. And now the verdict for her. Mm. Elsie Marie, Jordan, Jefferson, Milner, Hagens, not all of those names are real to protect the family. Mm. Guilty of murder with malice, life imprisonment. She clutches Eddie's arm. Together they sob, their family sob. No one is cheering now. Pierce asks that the all male jury be polled. A defendant's counsel will sometimes do that. Maybe under the pressure of standing up in a courtroom, one at a time, a juror will change their mind or say something that can be used on appeal. So one at a time, each man stands, says his name and the word guilty. With each one, the sobs of Eddie and Elsie Marie grow louder. Sheriff Lightfoot sitting next to Eddie, pats his shoulder. Well, that is not the end. <laughs> not even close, y'all. There is some crazy poo-poo to come. Next time, we find out what happened to Eddie Hagens. Did he die in the electric chair? What happened to Elsie Marie? Did she get out of prison and have a happy life? I had heard a rumor about that, y'all. I had hoped it was not true. Spoiler alert, it was true. So, subscribe now and tap into Untapped with M.E.